Welcome. This concept of trading item for item or commodity for commodity uh, involves uh, a system which we often refer to as the barter system or barter exchange. And in this case, there is no currency or money exchanged. It is, it is simply, you know, chickens for baskets, you know, between a village, something like that. Or it might also involve a certain service being exchanged for another service. Even today, in the 21st century, uh, we still use a barter system. Um, we don't see it very often, but you may have seen on a very well-known website that there is a, a barter category where people today, if they don't have the money uh, to either purchase something that they want or they have a certain service they need to perform like auto repair and they can't do it themselves, they might very well post here and ask for an exchange of item for item or an exchange of service for service. So you can see here I have a map of early Neolithic obsidian trade routes in the Fertile Crescent. Obsidian, a hard glassy volcanic rock that was oftentimes used um, for cutting tools or also used for decorative purposes, jewelry, what have you. That you know, for those villages that had access to obsidian, they would sometimes use that and exchange it for other items that they needed. Now one very important point I want to make about early human trade is, is that uh, trade al always involves more than just the physical items that are being exchanged. People are going to form relationships with representatives from other societies that they come into contact with. They're going to chat. They're going to talk about things. So these trade routes, as they develop and deepen and, and, and spread over larger and larger geographic areas, will be the perfect conduit or means by which information will be exchanged between these early societies. Information and, a little more ominously, germs will have the ability to spread sickness, uh, will spread through some of these trade routes. Information regarding metalworking is a good example of information that would have been exchanged along some of these early Neolithic trade routes. The development of bronze weapons and tools. Um, this is something that all it takes is one civilization discovering it and then trading with another civilization and that, that information will soon disseminate. And ultimately over time what we're also going to see is, is that uh, human beings are going to start to adapt their spoken language. They're going to start to develop a written component to their spoken language. And so the earliest recorded human society in which they created written records those records have survived to the present day and can be decoded. There's several caveats embedded in that statement. But if all these things are taken together, um, then we look at the Sumerian civilization as the earliest recorded human society that we know about. And it will develop in a region known as Mesopotamia, which simply means land between the rivers. And you can see the map here. What we're talking about today is a region that encompasses not only the present day uh, country of Iraq but also kind of stretches over into Turkey and North Africa um, through the Sinai Peninsula. And the Sumerians are remembered for a number of different advances. Above all, developing the system of writing cuneiform. As you can see, the technology is very, very simple. It involves wet clay, um, hammering it out into a tablet or, or uh, styling it into what become known as stele, these independent columns, uh, self-standing columns, and then taking reeds from beside the riverbank, the Tigris or the Euphrates, and cutting them to certain shapes or using the, the blunt ends of them to simply make indentations or wedge-shaped designs in them. That's what cuneiform actually means is wedge shaped and leaving this written record has uh, um, and, and us being able to find it and decode it has allowed us a fascinating glimpse into these people's society. This is an ancient Sumerian stele, self-supporting column with an image of a Babylonian military leader by the name of Hammurabi who will come to power between about 1800 and 1750 BC and what Hammurabi will do is he will forcibly unite the Sumerian city-states. Hammurabi had to forcibly unite 
many of the Sumerian city-states because each one was an independent unit. Each one had its own political leadership, its own trade routes, its own military. They were self-contained units. And so um, uh, conquering these city-states meant that they would have to give up their autonomy, which they were not willing to do um, unless someone like Hammurabi forced them to do it. So after subduing the Sumerian city-states, Hammurabi, in order to get everyone on the same page, um, ordered an assessment of all existing laws, the legal code in many of these formerly independent towns, and he compiled them all into what becomes known as Hammurabi's Code, the first written law code in human history that we know of. And this code consisted of about 282 different laws governing virtually every aspect of Sumerian people's lives. And as a law code, it really gives us a good glimpse into what these people held dear in their day-to-day -day lives. So these are some examples of this ancient law code. And you can probably notice in here that the death penalty was quite liberally applied. Um, in this ancient society. That was true of almost all early human societies. They simply don't have penitentiaries. They don't have a, a system whereby criminals are incarcerated for any length of time. and These things just don't exist in the ancient world. So oftentimes their legal codes appear quite harsh to us today, but their thinking was is that um, they don't have an adequate police force as a deterrent to keep people to uh, to doing the right thing. Uh, so they quite literally want to scare you to death um, on the front end to make you think not just once but twice about potentially disrupting um, the peace and order of some of these societies. So lots of death penalties you'll notice um, in this law 195. The idea of if a son raises his hand to his father, his hand shall be sawed off. Clearly there's an emphasis on, in particular, male authority in the household. You've probably seen this before, um, the concept of sort of an eye for an eye in, in 196. If you'll notice, however, with the next two laws following that one, that it was not always a case of an eye for an eye in Sumerian society. A lot of it had to do with the status of the person committing the crime and the status of the person, of the victim, um, who was the, the recipient of whatever violence um, that was done to them. So you'll notice that, uh, for example, they mentioned if a man put out the eye of a freedman, he does not have the same penalty. He only has to pay one gold mina. And then, even less of a penalty, if a man put out the eye of a man's slave, he shall pay only one half of its value, meaning he owes even less money. So this tells us they very clearly practiced slavery, as did all ancient human societies, and that if you weren't a slave, you were likely part of a freedman class. This is the your average people, um, your artisans, your farmers, what have you. And um, this was usually the bulk of the population in many of these ancient societies. And also typically in ancient societies you have a group of people known as the nobility. These are usually the economically very wealthy, those in positions of political leadership. Um, these are folks who we often kind of use the blanket term nobility because they believe themselves to be of noble birth. And what family you were born into oftentimes determined who you would marry. There was an emphasis on trying to preserve wealth and influence from generation to generation. And this is true across all ancient civilizations throughout the world. Um, and so if, if you remember the nobility, for example, coming back to Sumerian society, in some cases you were not going to suffer punishment, or you would suffer a far reduced punishment, according to Hammurabi's code, if you were a member of this sort of uh, elite group of, of, of folks. You might also notice um, in law number six, if anyone steal the property of a temple or of the court, he shall be put to death. A lot of emphasis in Sumerian society on their religious belief, the temple being the place of worship. Their place of worship might be uh, located 
within what was known as a ziggurat, one of these massive kind of stepped stone structures that you, you still see the remains of today throughout this region. Um, the ziggurat was sort of the, the central meeting place for all the religious figures in, in this society. And regarding Sumerian religious belief, just like with all other human societies, we often refer to them as being polytheistic societies. Polytheism or uh, polytheistic belief is the worship usually of many different deities. Deity is just another term for uh, gods and goddesses. And typically speaking in ancient Samaria, as with all other human societies to begin with, this form of belief was usually centered around attributing um, spiritual significance to the many forces of nature, the sun, the moon, the wind, uh, the river, all these things that could have uh, the power really of life or death over your particular society. These were often objects of veneration or worship in ancient Samaria. So those therefore whose job it was to communicate with the deities, uh, the priestly class, there's that, that particular class of people um, was very highly revered and oftentimes had a great deal of power beyond just the, the spiritual power they were thought to wield. Now I want to show you this last slide here, not to confuse you, but to kind of give you a heads up. This is a course in world civilizations, and what we often see with early human civilizations is, is that um, once one civilization the Sumerians, for example, we just talked about, masters the art of translating their, uh, creating a written form of their spoken tongue, then that, that technology spills over into other civilizations that they trade with or come into conflict with. And so what you oftentimes see with early human civilizations is that they all start to sort of pop up and leave a written record almost at the same time. You don't hear anything regarding a, a written language among humans and for a very, very long period of time, almost like uh, microwave popcorn. <laughs> you stick it in the microwave and it, it's quiet, 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 but then you hear that first pop and then suddenly you start to hear as these civilizations, you know, sort of begin to reach critical mass and all master the art of writing, then suddenly it's pop, 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 pop. They're, they're all coming up at the same time. And oftentimes, these early civilizations are overlapping one another quite a bit geographically, and so, um, or excuse me, chronologically, and, and in some cases geographically too, in the case of, of the, the several that I have listed here on the slides. So just giving you a little bit of a heads up that the, the potential for confusing these early civilizations is very high. You need to pay quite a bit of attention because we're going to be moving around quite a bit geographically around the world talking about civilizations. We're going to be moving around quite a bit in time chronologically talking about uh, various groups of people and it's very easy to mix these things together and get them uh, get them wrong on the exam. So just giving you a heads up on that. So I've introduced you to the Sumerians. We'll move on to another civilization that will start to develop nearby the Egyptian civilization in the next slide set.